I, you know, I always feel like I'm going to like do some really like awesome thing, like drum roll or something else. And then I, <laughs> then I see the recording button and I'm like, no, not today, not this time. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new, a new installment of Club Moffat Talks, the Moffat Library podcast. Uh, very excited for you to join us today. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Chris DiPanetta, your host and one of the uh, instruction librarians here in the library. And I'm Joseph, and I'm also an instruction librarian. My name is Ryan Sandelson, and I am the Associate University Librarian for Public Services. We are joined here today by Jeffrey Clegg. Who uh, could not get into four library schools. Aw. No. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, like, where did you apply? <laughs> like, God University? <laughs> All right, and we're going to talk about some stuff a little bit later today, but before we get into all of that, let's just go around the, oh God, I wish I could say go around the table a little bit, but we're all in our own offices here. Well, do we want so... to talk about the fact at some point we might be going around a table at some point in the we future? We will be. We'll talk about that here uh, probably before we sign off. That's going okay. to be really exciting to talk about, but uh, yeah, we almost have our podcast studio up and running. We'll talk about that, like I said, after, after we get through our topic, whenever we're kind of you know rounding up we'll we'll talk about that a little bit so uh yeah but before we do all of that let's talk about what we're doing what we're what we're kind of exploring lately uh why don't we start off with you dr clegg so right now i'm looking at um really the religious studies uh i've been reading a lot more within formation and canonization uh biblical texts as well as uh biblical history uh, more on the archaeological side rather than on the creation of the Bible. Um, one of the current books that I'm reading is out of uh, Cambridge Press that deals with the why question. And as the author, whose name I'm blanking on, uh, points out, most people are asking about the who, what, when, and where, but they're really asking why did the formation of at least the Old Testament come about? And you know, part of this is really a story of nation building more so than just strict religiosity that has taken hold over time. And it's a really interesting and worthwhile um, take on just how a nation is built, but also how it outsurvives many of its peers within the Near East at the same time, uh, why it can outlast the Assyrian Empire, for instance by thousands of years, despite the fact that it has every numerical disadvantage to it. So pretty interesting stuff and worthwhile if you have anyone has any interest in especially biblical or ancient Near Eastern history. Yeah, I took a few classes. I took a one class on that in uh, in college. Um, very interesting. Um, basically, the the history of how the Bible was put together. Very, very interesting stuff. The question go next? is always one that it's that's super interesting to me. Well, you have the two stories. You have the biblical story and you have the archaeological story. Mm -hmm. And what most people mess up, and Irving Finkel is a great author, author on this, is they want to, or at least a lot of the more Protestant version of this, is trying to combine both narratives. And the reality is that they're always going to be separate. And the archaeological narrative is going to point one way, whereas the biblical narrative is what it is. They will, no matter how much we use these founding mythologies, they never work. And they can never be combined into a synchronous whole. And I think that's kind of the interesting part that gets left out in some of the history courses, um, especially if people take an intro to world civilization. And they get to the part that is really dealing with the rise of the Hebrew nation is that unless you're paying attention to the archaeological refer uh, portion of this, which most people don't, especially high schools, it diverges so vastly to what we know, even stories like the uh, Exodus. Uh, if you look at the archaeological record, Exodus never happened. It couldn't have happened according to what we have. There are no mid our Near Eastern middens or trash piles out there that would chart the story the way it's told. So it's 
kind of the fascinating take on this is that history will always point us in kind of the real direction of where the story goes versus what creation myths that we have that are told for moral reasons. And again, I'm also reminded of the fact that one of the things they've, they've realized over the last 20 years is that the pyramids were built by farmers, not uh, not slaves. We actually have the records of them paying them to, to help build the, the pyramids and stuff like that we found in the archaeological records. Yeah. I was recently made aware that um, the book of Revelations was actually written quite a bit after the main text of the New Testament. And there were like several different books that were in consideration to be the like the coda to the New Testament, where eventually it was just decided that the one the one that was chosen was the one that was uh, pretty overtly uh, antagonistic toward the uh, the Roman Empire. And there's there's some uh, like nationalistic parts of it. That's why the tone is so much different from the New Testament. It almost it almost becomes more Old Testament like in its tone because it's it's telling this apocalyptic tale that is really really specifically uh targeted toward the roman empire but it also is is there acting as kind of a wrap-up to the whole thing so it can be read as one big piece art airman's uh who's a professor of religious studies at unc uh university of north carolina chapel hill probably has some of the best works on especially early biblical and canonical formation of the Bible and why some of these checks were chosen in the fourth century AD. And it stands as probably like, he's probably one of my favorite authors, no matter what, just because he's willing to take a step outside of just his own central belief to point us towards these conversations that sometimes get hidden. Um, not so much just because we want to hide them. It's just we don't have the time. They're engrossing. They would take several college semesters to really unravel all of what goes on from at least 33 AD to the fourth century on how all these are chosen and why Revelations makes it versus many of the other uh, apostolic tales that were just shunted aside or seen as much later heretical when of the time they are very much within some of the orthodoxy. It's, it's one of my favorite areas of Gnosticism is just how it, it's a very uh, it's a very consistent text about what it's about. But um, when placed up against the like the orthodoxy and what's considered canon, just the fact that Christ is teaching gain knowledge and break out of the physical world. And this, you know, there's more to it than than just what the church is saying. That's the kind of stuff. It's like, of course, that's not going to make the cut. No. But it's always interesting to see how it how it kind of butts up against what we refer to as the canon. It's always a tale of winners. Unfortunately. Yeah. So I'm based on the grid that we have here, I'm going to say we're going diagonal this time. Joe, you want to tell us about uh, what you've been <laughs> up to lately? Sure. Um, I have not been doing anything remotely as a, uh, as uh, academic or intellectual or serious as as that. Um, I just finished watching the final season of Doom Patrol, which I really enjoyed. Um, uh, I, I don't know where I am in, 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 you know, population percentages, but I'm one of the people that's actually excited about the Marvels movie and may actually go to a theater to see it. Um, I am reading, uh, I'm currently reading, uh, this Jim Butcher uh, Dresden book, Small Favors. Uh, and I just picked up up, up off of our shelf uh, in CML, uh, this book by Kelly Yang, it's top story. And the reason that I did, uh, partly is just because it was new to us uh, last month. It came in with our Junior Library Guild uh, books last month. But it's actually a sequel to her book, Front Desk, which I did read and really, really enjoyed. And I was like, okay, I got to check that out. Um, went to Hangar Holiday this weekend, which was massively crazy crowded. Um, just, you know, living the dream. Cool stuff. Sounds good. I'll go next, I guess, because I know you want to talk about something for a while. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, as a small Cthulhu over my shoulder says, I am going to be doing the weird fiction class with Peter Fields come spring. And we're in the middle of putting together the reading list. We've kind of narrowed it down, but I need to, I need to read uh, the new Cthulhu anthology. Um, and I need to read um, uh, Lovecraft Country, which I both started both of those this weekend. And hopefully I'll have those done um, by Thanksgiving so we can put together the the complete reading list of how we want to put stuff together as far as the class goes. Um, I need also at some point rewatch Annihilation. So as that comes online for us, uh, so I know what I'm talking about when that's part of it. And then at some point I need to revisit Lovecraft, um, Arthur Macon and CL Moore because they're also part of our reading list. So I'm, that's where I'm at right now is I'm, I've finished up all the readings and watchings for the classes I'm teaching this semester. And I'm diving back into the stuff for, for next semester at this point. Now, does little Cthulhu, um, does he influence your thoughts or does he like whisper? Or is it just like the the vague thoughts that come out of his mind that aren't? Little like Cthulhu structured? is a bribe from students in the class I did um, five years ago, not knowing that I have nothing to do with their actual grades. Um, <laughs> Peter actually returned his gift because he says, I can't because I am grading you. I'm like, I'm not grading him. I'm going to keep my my gift. So that's that's. That's where he came from. Uh, there was a pair of students in the class who really enjoyed the class last time we did it. And they, they gave gifts both to me and Peter out after the class was done. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, I thought so too. Uh, may I go? Please. All right. Um, yeah, no, I, I really don't have a lot to say. Like I was saying before the podcast, um, my, my daughter ran me ragged this weekend and my wife is uh, having pretty regular contractions now, so um, we're at 35 weeks, and I don't know how much longer I'll be here at work. For, you know, I'm taking like a month and a half off, so um, that's – we did it before. We can do it again, right? Um, so that's that's nerve-wracking. Um, really, the I haven't been doing anything new. I've just been playing a lot of older video games, just kind of – trying to take it easy while working on um, some of my last few classes for library school. I did want to talk about something that came out on Netflix recently that um, Ryan had been um, threatening me into, into reading. It was originally a manga. Uh, now it's a, um, a short finished anime on Netflix. Um, a UVA. It is an OVA actually. That's OVA, that's what's yeah. really cool about it. Um, actually, they call it an ONA now because it's original network in animation. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get into what an OVA is here. That's boring and stupid. Basically, they're longer anime episodes. That's that's all it is. Um, and they're they're of much higher quality. Um, this is um a work called Pluto by the the author um Naoki Urasawa. He also uh, wrote a manga that was made into an anime called Monster, which is equally uh i'm gonna just say incredible um it very he's he works very well with like mystique and intrigue and just creating this this really slow burn thriller story and pluto is that times a thousand placed into astro boy it, it will literally it will make you cry it will make you cry Chris. It, it will make so, you cry several times so yes, it is. It's an adaptation of an Astro Boy story, but instead of it being like the Disney kind of like silly whatever uh, Disney fied Astro Boy like the original was, it is this author's uh, really dreary take on it, which is which actually does work with the like cartoony robot look of everything else. Like it still is like the robots are like big and bulky and kind of silly looking. But that's kind of by design to make them a little more approachable in the world because robots are still like butler made level like workers, but they also have a level of sentience that allow them some amount of emotion. Like they're they're kind of like they they still do a lot of work with humans. They do like environmental things and they, they actually serve a role outside of just being like like workers, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I don't quite like I have an idea of where the story's going, but um it's basically a murder mystery where there's some robot that is killing other robots that were uh like commanders in this robot war. 
some years before the story where Astro Boy was was one of the commanders. Uh, there's the story begins with the murder of this uh, environmentalist robot. Um, he's he, like his forest is burned down and his head is cut off with like branches that are like placed as antlers as a as a sign. And that's how the story begins. And I was really thinking it would be that like like who done it kind of thing, but instead it it pulls back and they start showing you like one of the first robots that is um killed as like kind of uh just off to the side as um I can't tell you, the word is escaping me. Um collateral damage. Um he has a wife, a little robot wife and um she's her only request it's either she can have her memories erased or she can have his data chip inserted into her her circuits and she chooses to have the the chip inserted so she can remember him um so all of this is going on and like abruptly half an hour into the first episode and i i assume the manga is like this too it shifts completely to this um this old disabled man i'm not i think he's blind he's blind he's blind he's a he's a musician um who's like this super famous composer but he doesn't want to do anything else because there's this composition that he just can't figure out like there's something missing to it uh so he hires a um a robot butler to help take care of his stuff the robot butler becomes extremely invested in the song that this that this composer is uh trying to write and the composer starts getting violently angry because he completely, like, he rejects the notion that robots can ever feel the same passion that creates, like, art. Because it's not really love and, like, um, just tenderness that that this composer is is working with. It's, like, fury and anger and this, this deep uh, grudge that he holds that's keeping him writing music. But it's also why he can't really piece together this final composition and it was so touching and so moving and the way that he interacts with this this butler robot who is actually he's he's a uh, a commander in one of the in that in that big robot war and his like their whole thing is this this old composer is like i you can never understand how to be a human you're a robot that was designed for killing you, you'll never understand how it is that i create this these works of art so don't even think about touching my instruments and the robot keeps coming back and he's like playing keys he's like i i heard you humming in your sleep and i think this is i think this is what you were trying to do and i think it would bridge that part of your composition that you were making and the way that it it didn't play out any way i thought it would i i really thought it would be a lot more um uh i i guess um uh, just straightforward like like you would think and like the turns and twists this just one half hour little story makes um that's almost completely unrelated to the rest of it um i was i was moved like i i ended it and i i just right away i was like okay i'm not i will not rush this i have to enjoy like i have to really see this thing through to the end because i was so moved by just that one little story arc and they use that to cut back into the main story and emotionally invest you into the mystery because you don't see how it's going to like kind of merge back together. And it does so well. And it's, it's just, uh, I don't even want to talk about like how it fits in with Astro boy because it's, it's just. Don't, don't let people watch it themselves. Yeah. Um, if you have Netflix, if you have any interest in anime, like, like historical anime, this is going to go down as an all time best. It, if it hasn't already, um, uh, the manga is well regarded. The author is, is really, um, beloved, uh, just yet yeah, it's eight episodes, hour long episodes. They're all on Netflix already. I think it adapts the full manga. Just check it out. Um, I showed Again, my he's wife doing, really what he's doing like is what all the great works have done about about robots and humanity. There, it, it's not really about about robots. It's about humanity. It's about how humanity treats each other. It's how we treat minorities. It's how we we you know it's 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 about racism to some extent as well. And and that's he does a great job. He does as well as I Robot or um, or Blade Runner or any of the great um, um, stories that are basically saying there is this divide between robots and humanity and what that means 
yeah it's it's that exactly it's it's a very classical tale of um robots and humans um and robots as being types like second class citizens or or what have you and just the way it's told is you know and you bring up you bring up stories like that and you can say like yeah everything's every story's been told before all the types of like the great works or whatever it's all these days it's all just derivatives of what's been told before but a really well told story like this one it doesn't matter if it's been told before because it's just so compelling and it's just so well written uh, i'd recommend it to anyone i showed it to my wife as soon as as soon as i was done with that first episode i sent her a trailer and said look like we i don't know if if uh, i'll continue watching this on my own but this this touched me in a way that an anime series is not in a in a very long time and she said okay is it in english because you know i hate reading <laughs> i said uh, yeah it's in english um which that really good english done too so uh yeah pluto check it out it's it's fantastic uh netflix somehow hits it out of the park again i just wish they do 20th century boys because i think that's his magnum opus i really yeah, do get, but again i recommended yeah. pluto to you because i knew you would enjoy it and i'm glad you're enjoying it oh yeah yeah love it um, I really want to see a 20th Century Boys adaptation as well. Uh, so that, I think, burns way through the five minutes for each speaker <laughs> that we have here. <laughs> um, Dr. Clegg, you said that you wanted to talk to us about a work uh, titled How the Sausage is Made. Is that correct? <laughs> so just to preface this, I, I usually teach business writing and advanced grammar, two of the most boring courses on earth. So I'm going to talk about something even more boring. Um, but really what I want to talk about was the creation of the Norton um, Guide to English Literature and its beginnings and some of its weird swerves and thinking mainly just through an article written by a former professor of mine, Sean Sheskreen who in the journal Critical Inquiry talked a lot about this formation of a text that at least students who take um, survey of English literature here or may have taken it at a community college, a very common staple of or all core curriculum across the nation. If you end up taking the English side of it instead of American or world literature, you will have about a 90% chance of encountering a Norton text, Norton anthology. However, the the beginnings of Norton Anthology are kind of sadly interesting, but interesting if you only care about the economics of the publishing market. Um, prior to the Norton coming on the scene in the late 1960s, there were only two big anthologies of English literature out there. Um, the College Survey of English Literature, which was a huge tome that weighed about six pounds, had over 1,100 pages, printed on regular stock paper, um, like you would find in a regular book. And a precursor to that, which was a 1948 text that was another compendium, also very large, over a thousand pages, also heavy stock paper, about 10 pounds in weight, you know, something that for the average undergraduate would break their back if they were carrying it around too often. Norton comes out with their edition and it's the first one to ever use Bible paper. Kind of going back to my earlier comments about the Bible, but Bible paper, for those who may not know, very thin, very easy to tear paper that's also very easy to smudge ink on. And due to some of the technological increases in the 1950s and 60s, much better, but also much cheaper. So this is one of the huge selling points for this new wonderful work of anthological work that's come out and it is one of the and i hate pausing here sorry about that we'll cut that out in post but one of the big selling points is that this is relatively a expansive but cheap edition goes on the marketplace and sells hundreds of thousands of copies in the first edition becomes the industry standard all the way up until today we have 60 years of dominance for one publishing company. And what Dr. Sheshgreen's article really is trying to do is get at the beef of why 
And what are the real economics? Like, what is the actual economic stake of having one publishing company have the dominance over the academic market? And what he comes to the conclusion of is that one will never find out. All this falls under the beauty of trade secrets. How much authors get paid? How much Norton actually makes per anthology? We have no idea outside of the fact that it has an overwhelming representation of up to 90% of market share. We know that it is up to 95% of Norton's profits per year. It's actually what funds most of Martin's, of Norton's other operations for textbook sales. If it wasn't for the Norton anthologies as a whole, um, Norton itself would still be publishing pamphlets as it started out in the 1940s of doing. Um, but the actual integration of all these texts is interesting in a lot of ways because throughout the 1960s, 1970s, you get the first two editions of it. Um, very staid, standard canonization of the English language. And for those who don't know what canonization is, it's just that process of creating an authoritative sense of what works count within anything, whether it's English literature, American literature, uh, any literature whatsoever. It's putting it at the top tier. And the standardization that has gone on throughout much of the Romantic period, Victorian period, into the 1960s, pretty much had your top players, Milton, Shakespeare, Chaucer, um, all male authors in the variety of things. Um, the early first edition looks much like its predecessors in that regard um, for primers of English literature, pretty much going off of who we might think, off of who they feel has the most value for students and those who might want to actually read this for the first time. The second edition gets some small little changes. For the first time, you have women incorporated into it. Um, you have the, have about 6,000 pages or so that are 6,000 words. I'm not, I'm sorry, not 6,000 pages, 6,000 words that are dedicated to women authors and their prefaces to the works that are included, which are a grand total of five women for about five different pieces. 99% uh, of the corpus is still male dominated. This is considered a landmark and the uh, editors of this text pat themselves on the back. It increases sales. It's in response to the market. We have no idea of the impact upon this. And this is one thing that Shesh Green talks about is that while the cultural landscape of English studies is ultimately changing, we really don't know how much influence Norton plays on that, but there's a lot that opens these doors to try and discover. These are questions that we should be asking ourselves and trying to answer as scholars. How much important do, importance does one work have for ultimately changing the ebbs and flows of how we read? And for the incorporation of different female authors, this first aspect of having uh, Rebecca Barrett Browning in uh, as a canonized author. What does that actually mean to students and how we progress through reading this one work for the first time? Because it's probably the first time we've ever been exposed to it since it was initially published into our own chain of reasoning for how we continue to go on throughout our own studies. How does it influence us? Again, questions that we ultimately don't always seek to answer. But how does it also change the dynamics of future publishing? So these two editions have a, a profound impact that we still don't quite know all of that impact. We just have a few conversations that Shesh Green finds in the archives uh, through one of the major authors, Mike Abrams, who edited the first three editions of the Norn Anthology of English Literature. Um, the third edition is kind of interesting in that it's pretty much a response to the second in that you have a more outsized growth of women within this. Um, the growth of feminism within the 1960s and 70s leads to uh, old, utter change in the focus around 1989 as they published a the third edition. And the third edition has incorporation of more women authors, including uh, Orinoco, 
for the first time at length. Um, a exceedingly great work um, that is probably the first real exposure that American audiences get to uh, an important 18th century author um, and work that really does start to talk about slavery in a completely different way than what most people have been exposed to through Joseph Conrad's In the Heart of Darkness. Um, and a few other abolition or uh, abolitionist works that usually would creep in, but mostly in the American anthology. In the British anthology, this is probably the first time you actually begin to see any discussion of Black Africans or at least African experience within the anthology itself, but primarily driven more so by feminist concerns rather than racial concerns. If anything, you begin to see this, and you can see the Norn Anthology in a couple of different ways with the third edition, as a text that becomes much more responsive to decanonization, to really thinking about the can uh, canon of English literary works against uh, the grain. And this is not because the editors were completely sold on this. This was mostly as a marketing decision. And something that Chef Screen uncovers through a couple um, correspondences that were part of an archive of Mike Abrams, who was the main editor, that there's a very cynical reason to this. It's not because they wanted to incorporate more women. They just knew it was a better selling point. And for most people who look at the anthologies that they have in any classroom, we tend not to think about this as a primary driver for why things are staged in the way that they are, why the texts that we are given are written in the way that they are. We tend to think of these as scholars being scholars. We wanna give you the best possible knowledge. We rarely ever think of the flip side on this is the way in which knowledge is marketed towards us and constantly a response to market pressures and what a textbook company feels will sell the most. And to me, that's kind of the interesting part of all this is that once you have the hinge from, we're trying to give you the best possible knowledge with the first and second edition, have something that will sell and become the primary source of uh, information about English literature to suddenly a shift and thinking about this primarily as a marketing engine. How can we continue to meet the needs of diverse audiences, but also really just sell to them. You know, what's questionable? And at the same time, these little conversations that are happening with the editorship that I think are also vastly important, where they're completely going against us. They don't care about the marketing side. In fact, they're willing to continue to be gatekeepers of what is considered a good or good uh, bad text. Um. So let's just fast forward a little bit to the um, publication of the fourth edition. The fourth edition is exceedingly interesting because it's about the time that we hit this uh, point of the mid nineties, more social care, uh, more social concern, more emphasis on modern literature, literature published within the last uh, 80 years. And the editors of the text do not want it whatsoever. Despite the fact that market pressures are saying that students are more interested in contemporary, at least within the last 80 years of texts that have come out, the editors of this, Abrams being one of them, are pushing back and saying that a writer like Salman Rushdie, uh, author of uh, probably one of the most critically <laughs> beloved, but very contentious works of the last 40 years satanic verses is not worthy of inclusion within this text because who cares kind of becomes the main thrust of uh, the Norton editorship. They will devote more pages to English Romanticism than they ever would to a text, even an excerpt of Salman Rushdie's work which has been on the minds of plenty of people for the past five years, has been an incredibly part, uh, big part of socio-political dialogue 
across the world for the past five years, but they just don't see the value of it. And it's an incredibly contentious story that I think that we don't even think about sometimes when we think about, again, what we read and why it's included and why the people who are in charge of this aren't always thinking about what their readers want, but at the same time, the marketing executives in the company are seeing this as a gangbusters deal, something far more important, far more and better selling. But the real story of this, and what I think is kind of the brilliance of Shesh Green's article is a story of Longman. Longman being one of the competing publishers in the field. In 1997, they decided that they want to publish their own anthology of English literature. Norton, being a company that cares about its image, is thinking about publishing their 2000 edition. There being a, about a two year um, break between when it finally gets published in 98 and 2000 when it officially gets put on the market. They want to see what Longman is doing. And you actually find, and uh, Sean Sheshgreen finds a lot of correspondence where uh, the editors of the Norn Anthology are actively seeking to sabotage and find out what Longman is trying to publish. They are soliciting from uh, David Damrosh, who is the Longman editor, as well as going through other people at Princeton University where Damrosh teaches to find out what exactly is within the con table of contents. And Damrosh actually like gives him a little bit, he plays around because he knows that his competitors want this information. They want to be able to make sure that they have the best thing on the market and they keep their top rank. While Longman is trying to produce probably one of the better versions of this, it's more incorporative of what they feel good English literature could be. So Sheshkreen finds within this archive of emails um, between Abrams, um, Stephen Greenblatt, who was one of the editors, and a few other people that they actually get a copy of the table of contents. And the way that it's phrased within the emails is that this was given to them in a brown paper bag in a parking lot in Miami. Total cloak and dagger, as he mentions it. However, you know, he says, like, this is probably not a true story. This is probably just a bunch of puff put in there. But at the same time, you know, they still have access to a document they're not supposed to have. And this little cloak and dagger research actually produces probably one of the most intentional moves I've ever heard of a publisher ever doing, which is the Longman edition that comes out versus the seventh edition of the North edition the Norton anthology that comes out side by side have these same works. It's obviously, it's obviously true that Norm was able to get their hands on the table of contents because every single edition that Longman makes, Norton makes to a T. It's exactly the same. Every incorporation. So it tells you a little bit of something also about how editors and at least publishing companies are constantly thinking about ways to overthrow other ones and how these market demands are sometimes enough to take people who, like ourselves, are supposed to be ethical scholars and make them do things that could potentially get us in a lot of trouble. You wouldn't expect a publishing company to actually go out of their way to seek and find other people that will divulge information about a book that early and think that it actually has this cloak and dagger tale to it. But it's one of those startling points that Sheshgreen finds out is that this was all about simple subterfuge and trying to find with intelligence gathering something that we don't obviously, obviously think about as being important. Um, what I think this kind of story tells us is that all these textbooks that we buy as students are manufactured to us for very specific reasons, but they have backstories to them that sometimes are very surprising. No one would think that a company like Norden 
would actually go out of its way to try and find out exactly what its pub, uh, competition is trying to publish at all times. Nor would it hide the fact of how much it's actually making per edition. Um, the best guesstimates is that, you know, beyond what we are obviously might think, but it's in the, you know, double digits of millions and the uh, editors are getting paid somewhere per copy um, a couple thousand dollars out of this, out of their contract. They're fully vested um, stakeholders within the company after a couple additions. But this is actually an arms race. Much like military arms race, textbooks are an arms race to get not only your attention, but also to grab a foothold by doing any kind of means it possibly can to grab onto you and get something more. Something the average student, some that even the average professor doesn't always think about when we're in uh, evaluating text for inclusion into our class. What exactly are the stakes of this? We're usually thinking about cost. Is this going to be too costly for our students? Are, we're thinking about access to the materials. Is this going to provide the best possible range of access for what our students need to know? Is it going to cover all the uh, works that we want to cover or are we going to have to supplement? from this. We're thinking about design sometimes. Is this accessible to all students? Simple things like, is the print too small? Is it too large? Is it um, worth the amount of pages that it's actually, um, are we going to use the whole text, in fact? But we really think about what is actually going on in the internal side of this. And this is the thing that Shesh Green really never can get a hold of that I think tells us larger story that we, and I think a lot of bibliophiles, people who really enjoy um, books, but also people who really enjoy, enjoy the idea of publishing, need to get a little bit firmer hold of is what's really going on behind the scenes. And there was a great book that came out about over a decade ago on the history of uh, Farrell, Strauss, and Giraud, the publishing house in New York, which has the same sort of subterfuge within it um, of how they are constantly going through and poaching works that are coming out onto the market before they can be bought up by other publishers, lying to authors in some cases uh, about the viability of a text so that they can get it before another publisher comes in and swoops in and grabs it from them. Amazingly, it's a very cutthroat industry. And you would expect that for the normal publishing realm, uh, fiction books. But surprisingly, it's not that different for academic publishers. These considerations that we're making, kind of interesting in that regard, that I guess I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> Cut this. <laughs> Cut the whole damn thing. So that's yeah, that's that's extraordinarily interesting. Uh, I mean, the one thing that comes to mind for me is, do the publishing houses that own those specific like short stories or chapters of texts or whatever are they fine with just licensing out those same chapters to different publications? Like, is that like as long as you're willing to pay, they're just yeah, yeah. You you two can both have the exact same text no matter what. So it really depends. And I've actually worked on an anthology before uh, where I called and talked to different license holders for different works, which surprisingly, there's a license holder for Edgar Allan Poe. You would not have thought there would be somebody who actually controlled it. There is. Um, if they have the license to it, it becomes one of those weird little games where it's like yes we want this very much um and they will try to work out a deal depending on the publisher so that they can retain uh access to this because they see it as a selling point um if they're anthologized in one work then the other works that are out there will have a chance of being bought uh to kind of go back to like the hp lovecraft uh and the word fiction course you know, having an anthology in a Amer uh, book like the Norton Anthology of American Literature for Lovecraft would be a boon to Lovecraft's estate. Um, and they would very much welcome it. But you think to text that 
don't have a licensee to them. Anything that has been out there for so long, um, like Jeffrey of Monmouth, you know, where there is no license holder for a medieval um, author. Those are fair game. And that tends to be where they are looking at the pure profit angle of this is how many texts can we get for free? And when they're looking at modern texts, I think it's probably one of the unsaid parts of this is that they're going to have to pay royalties for those. And those royalties are incredibly expensive to gather. Um, you know, I think the most that we were ever asked for was for an author who'd been dead for 100 years at that point and around $10,000 for use of their work. And that was just to secure one uh, short story that we could only excerpt, not even the full short story. If we wanted more, it would cost, uh, I think they were looking at $30,000 for a full copy, non-exerted, and they would do the exhortation. Uh, we would have no um, hand in doing of excising any of the text. That would all be done on the estate's part. Well, that is I'm wild. confused for a second. Domain. Let me just let me just throw this in here, um, because copyright is something we we care about a lot here in the library. You right. said Poe is still underneath license. How is that possible? Because I thought the maximum you could have in the United States is 95 years after their death. So it depends on who owes. My understanding is it depends on who owns some rights uh, to different versions. Ah, uh, the have... versions. Okay. There are some things that are always going to be out there, like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald last year, some of his work entered into public domain. Uh, some rights holders are able to get different editions extended throughout time. Gotcha. Um, George Washington Cable, I remember for some of his Br'er Rabbit, there was somebody who owned the rights to that that wasn't part of the Cable estate. And we were having trouble navigating that for the anthology because it was who actually owns these uh, progenitor stories to like the uh, Br'er Rabbit stories that we all know, uh, mostly from, I believe it was Disney who uh, produced some of the uh, Br'er Rabbit tales as animated. I, we couldn't quite figure out if Disney owned those or if there was still another person who owned those. It all really depends if you do a translation, by the way, and this is where some of the murky stuff comes in, um, and this is really for like Scottish and Irish authors who write in Old Scots or uh, Celtic languages, the translation holder usually is the one who owns the rights to it. Yeah. And that can that carry makes on sense. That makes sense. Like Seamus Haney's Beowulf, you have to pay Seamus Haney yeah. uh, rights to that. Because that that's a reinterpretation of the original text, right? But I think if you if you if you go with what Poe published during his lifetime, as it appeared in the actual magazine, I'm pretty sure that's all in the public domain. Yeah, it all is. Yeah. Um, but there are some other things that I believe were bought up mm -hmm. later on. Uh, well, again, anything that wasn't published or anything where they changed something, and so forth. Like for example, The Hobbit is currently. Um, it's currently legal in, in the public domain in New Zealand and Canada. It's currently in the public domain, but that's the original the original version of it. If you go with his 1951 rewrite, that's not in the public domain. So right. Well, it's one of the. This is my big things that I kind of miss was when um, Google Books first happened. I love Google Books. Um, when they start putting their digitization of primarily Stanford's library up, you had full access to everything. And what I always thought was interesting is what ended up getting removed from full access, even though technically it should have been outside of copyright. And there's a whole wonderful story of that that still needs to be told of how copyright holders went back through and decided this still is not in public domain. Yes, this 1906 version is perfectly fine to have as a full, but this 1940 uh, reprint, no, you cannot have it. It's still within our aspis. Uh, and even though it like, hadn't sold a single copy since mm -hmm. probably 1950, yeah. it's just, oh, it's still within the limits. And this has gone back to like 2006 or so, I think when Google Books first started. But there is, some of this is like really on the publishers. Well, 
Uh, well, again, also it depends on the publisher trying to enforce it. I know that one of the reasons that um, Lovecraft is 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 out there right now, you mentioned him earlier, and I might be wrong about this story, but I was told that basically for years, Arkham House said they had the copyright until someone challenged them on it. And it turned out, no, they didn't actually have the copyright like they thought they did for a lot of stuff. And so a lot of stuff got released because, again, they, they just said for years, we have the copyright. And um, if you want to challenge this, you know, you're, it's going to cost you lots of money to challenge this in court. Someone finally stood up and challenged them and they kind of went, um, well, uh, um, um, well, uh, I guess we don't have the copyright. So again, it, it, you end up with stuff like that as well, where they, it, it, as long as the the publisher can can intimidate you not to challenge them, they return the copyright, whether or not it's it's actually they should have the copyright or not. Well, I mean, it's a Winnie the Pooh angle. Um, oh, yeah. I think this is actually a better topic, and I should have gone with this. Because <laughs> um, you think of it like uh, if you have <laughs> Winnie the Pooh without wearing like the uh, famous clothing that he wears, that's perfectly legal now. Yep. But the second you put clothing on him, Disney will challenge you. And that's how you ended up getting a horror movie of the Blood and Honey. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it came out with last year. Um, totally because it, that was the way that you skirted into the public domain was that one version of Winnie the Pooh versus the one that everyone knows and loves. And to me, I, it's kind I, of the fascinating thing about all this is that when we think about like why we buy all these hefty texts, it usually costs between 60 to a hundred dollars, especially for literature anthologies. Um, they're purposely done in a way that prevents them from buying the older editions. That's the whole reason why you have, I think they're up to the 13th edition, the Norn Anthology. Mm -hmm. Then they make those tiny little tweaks so that you can't buy used. And oh, yeah. it's, it's the, the same thing that I, pharmaceuticals companies do. We're going to add this little <laughs> tiny um little tiny molecule on the end of our, our drug. Therefore, it, it's still it's still in it's still in it's still licensed. Yep. Let me, let me tell you about the most frustrating experience I ever had in academia. I was an undergrad. This is this is it. This is the one. I was an undergrad. I was not sure what I wanted to get my major in. I thought I would take some criminal justice stuff, right? I was like, yeah, you know, maybe maybe this is the one I'm I'm will finally land on. Uh, that class got canceled because I was the only one who signed up for it. The book was called Criminal Justice Today. I went to uh, return it to the bookstore at the end of the semester just to just to trade it in for my next semester stuff. They handed it back to me with without a sense of irony, just completely stone faced, and said, "Actually, this class is using criminal justice tomorrow, so we can't take it back." And I wanted to leap across the table. I was so annoyed. Like, don't no, don't tell me the name that it's that it's tomorrow and not today. Just tell me you can't take it. Um, I'll say something else that you were saying about earlier about the fact that um. You know, we think that these editors have, uh, you know, this, these noble aspirations. The truth of the matter is, we tell such mythology in history classes, a history major here. Uh, I mean, we, we talk about these, we mythologize these great causes and stuff like that. But if you actually look at it, almost always these causes are driven, at least some of it is driven by um, socioeconomic things. So I'll give you some examples. Let's take uh, the abolition of slavery. Oh, yes. It was it was an important thing. The North was fighting against for the abolition of slavery. Well, why were they fighting for the abolition of slavery? Because they were terrified of the idea of factories employing slaves. Also, because they were also realizing why was the South fighting so hard for slavery? Because they knew that there was other colonies out there like India and the and and the South and South Southeast Asia where the 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 French and the British were thinking about setting up. Um, cotton plantations to compete with them. And so again, there's again these socioeconomic reasons behind things. I'll give you another one. Women's suffrage. We think, oh, it was this driving force for women. You know, the women were out there, they were really fighting for it. But the truth of the matter is the reason that went through like it did is because places like Wyoming to become a state, they're actually the first state that gave women the right to vote in this country. And they did so so they'd have enough voters to qualify for statehood. And then what happened is all the states started looking and go, wait a minute, they doubled the number of voters they have. 
That means every time someone basically lets women vote, they're going to double the number of seats they have in the House of Congress. And so it was really this political fear of, of, of other states controlling the House of Congress that drove the suffrage. And we think, oh, it's because, you know, all these great politicians were looking at the women saying, yes, we need to give them the vote. And it's this great noble cause. No, they were they were fighting for votes is really what it comes down to. They just wanted to control the same numbers they had in Congress. They didn't want that to change. And that's really what drove the, uh, what was it, the, well, I forget what amendment it was, but but we don't talk about that in history. We, we talk about, again, this great noble cause. And it was a great noble cause, but again, the things really driving it sometimes are not great and noble, unfortunately. Yeah. But it does, this is something that I think has kind of disappeared from American discourse, uh, especially since the end of the George W. Bush years. Uh, Texas Tech books, Texas textbook buyers. Oh, yeah. Um, as being one of the other drivers for at least high school textbooks, we don't hear about the um, Texas Educational Association anymore and some of the ideas that are ever present. If you go back to at least that early 2000s uh, when the evolution debates were happening and especially American history debates, the center part of that conversation was who's the number one textbook buyer in the country and it's the state of texas they knew if they uh, get something in the um, state of texas any everyone would buy it basically yeah yeah and how so much of the ideological work that was placed into these textbooks were really driven by what texas standards wanted and i think that's a lost story that we also have within the last decade that we're no longer paying attention to that i thought might come back up through some of the 2020 um, conversations we were having on race as a society, but it never came back. You know, uh, we focused more on Florida and some of the Florida standards that were happening for uh, like the ridiculous one that talked about how slaves were happy to be enslaved because it gave them a job and a function in life, um, which while ludicrous, uh, we weren't thinking about like, how does this actually get sometimes codified in the minds of people and lost in that discu discussion is all of like the socio-political and socio-economic stakes of textbook companies and how they think about these things. They care more about the bottom dollar, which is understandable. Every company should in place of what information actually sh should be in there. You know, there's the great history text or uh, history book that came out and the I want to say 94, 96, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me. That is all about, you know, all these different aspects of American history that never made it into the contemporary textbook, uh, especially high school textbook. Um, it was actually the first place I learned about the My Lai Massacre. And, um, you know, at that point, most history classes I had in middle school and high school Never gotten past World War II. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it was interesting to kind of find like this. Yeah, this is never covered. And I actually looked in my then eighth grade uh, history text and saw there was no coverage of this whatsoever. It was uh, a little bit about Vietnam and then straight into Jimmy Carter. And that's where the textbook ended because we used old text. <laughs> <clears throat> well, recently you find that again, that as a history uh, major, I was always very disheartened by the mythology. Uh, the mythologizing of of american history to some extent and it, it, i'm kind of like these were people they made mistakes i mean um i mean it's a, it, it's always seemed like oh it's a very clear thing the american revolution it was very you know it, we we broke away from um from from england i'm like no a few people broke from away from england the large majority of people in the united states were actually loyalists and it, it only only after years of war that they finally accepted or they we don't even cover the fact that a lot of thousands upon thousands of people right tens of thousands of people were driven out of their homes and stuff after the war was over and had to relocate in places like the uh the caribbean or relocate into canada because they were basically just you know they, they still felt themselves as british citizens and their neighbors said either get out or we're going to kill you basically so well i mean there's there's a great book that came out um 2020 i think called american lucifers and it's all about 
light. Um, how we have a history here of thinking about the production and things that cause light. And the author, who name I'm blanking on again, uh, is Daniel, and I'm forgetting his last name. I think it might be Bowen. Uh, talks about like whaling and the uh, movement Real of oil. ships yeah. all throughout the world to hunt down whales as one aspect of this. The other being pitch that comes out of North Carolina and the use of slaves in North and South Carolina to gather pitch. And phosphorus being kind of the last little part of this connection, um, the use and the cultivation of phosphorus and mines. But how all this was cratered once we discovered oil in the 1860s. And how so much of this idea of light production is this worldwide economic aspect that rarely ever gets talked about ever. But how vital it was in from the 17th through 19th centuries and to all these different little economic outposts across the world that also do inspiration. You know, my uh, colleague, Todd Giles, you know, he loves Moby Dick. He loves Billy Budd. He loves anything that comes out of uh, Herman Melville. But so much of the romanticism, but also reality of Wellville goes back to that need for yeah. things that cause light. I think another example, another great aspects. example of that. All uh, interconnected. One of the things that people don't think about, and I remember this happening during the first Gulf War, is people kept saying, no war for oil. I'm like, where have you been in the 20th century? Every single war is fought over oil. And they go, what do you mean? I go, why do you think the, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? It was to secure the Dutch oil fields in Indonesia. That was the whole purpose of them of, of them declaring war in the United States was secure oil. Yeah, and we like, embargoed oil has always been the, the driving force for most, most combats in the 20th century. One of the reasons why the British cared so much about uh, Palestine at that point um, especially after the Balfour Treaty of 1918 was protecting the oil reserves that were there because that was predominant in their mind after Hitler had gone through Romania as well as the Balkans uh, and, and ever so closely and the Northern African campaigns for why those were so vital for the British to protect. There's yeah. a big, there's, uh, I mean, there's a big uh, calling for the idea that the reason that um, Hitler declared war on Russia at the worst time was he wanted to secure those Russian oil fields because the Romanians weren't providing enough oil for his for his military at the time. So, I find that whenever those kinds of like those little little bits of history, almost like secret histories or, or what have you, whenever they get uncovered, especially now with just how fast information travels, it, it seems like people really want to make a conversation about that, like. Um, the one that comes to mind right now is uh, the Tulsa massacre. I hadn't heard anything about that until just a few years ago, and now it seems like it's it's like a like a hot button thing. Like just two or three years ago, it's like everyone was like, "Hey, did did you never hear about this in school? Like, did you never hear about this in history classes? Because I never I never knew about this one." And mm -hmm. suddenly, you have two HBO television programs where it's the the actual focal point of the story and. It's wild how that just becomes part of the national conversation. So I remember the um, hearing about the Tulsa massacres back in 1998. I can put a time period to this because I was a junior in high school. I graduated in 99. And I forget where I picked it up. I think maybe it had been a wire story, like there had been some kind of commemoration or, but I remember reading about it that early. And I think it's kind of the flashpoints of what we have. Um, the term kind of what you're looking for is actually micro history. Hmm. And it's more of a European tradition, although in the last 20 years, we've been uh, American historical, but also English uh, scholarship. It's become a little bit more well known. Um, there's a great book, The Cheese and the Worms by an Italian author. That goes in the whole idea of what is a micro history and it says little events that are insignificant on their face. And the story of the cheese and the worms is about a proto Protestant um, Catholic who doubts the history of the Bible. And he's talking about this from 
apparently a heresy that had been spread throughout Italy in the 15th century. And he goes on trial as a heretic and he's defending himself. And this is in what normally would be considered another inconsequential story of the Inquisition. But the reality of this is that it tells a larger part of culture and time in that one moment. And that's what micro histories really care about is it doesn't have to be this great profound moment. It just has to be something that tells us a little bit more about that stream that we might not ultimately hear about. Same author who did The Cheese and the Worms also did another one called The Night Battles on witchcraft in Italy. Um, Fantastic work that really just is hitting upon these little trials of witches. Um, and I think this is in the 16th century that utterly would go without comment. They might be a footnote in someone's dissertation, but they tell us a little bit more about um, at least unbelief and some of the rural and rustic folkways that primarily were driven by women at the time that are often still forgotten about but that gives us that little bit more to hold on to and think about. And micro histories, I think, are important for us to look at. And the Tulsa massacre, we need to think of less as a micro history, but as more of an important hinge moment to um, the destruction of black wealth in the United States. Um, one of many moments that we have sadly forgotten about. The other know, one that people have been talking about lately is the, um, Freeways and highways and how those and put into towns were basically creating entire sections of the town, usually black, um, of black neighborhoods that were then cut off economically um, from the rest of the country for the most part because of it. Well, I think that uh, the question that I've always had since I moved uh, to Wichita Falls is that is that divide on oh, yeah. uh, Kel very much part of that. And I think this is a great project that there hasn't been one that looks at that stark divide. I live on the edge of Kell on, I guess, what would be considered the good side. And when I first moved here, I remember going across the street um, from Kell and just being flabbergasted by how stark that divide is. Um, well, the other side of the railroad tracks is a real actual thing. That's the reason People right. would say that is because it was a way of dividing the town between the haves and the haves. In my own hometown of Alexandria, Louisiana, when they were building I-49 through it, um, I I came about just after they had started buying up the land, which used to be primarily the black part of town. And the displacement that happened as they built through that and some of the specific moves that were made by our town leaders at the time to really hopefully push those people outside that they would get their money and they'd move away. Um, but how that ended up 30 years later backfiring on them by creating a better voting block within my hometown, uh, a much more richer voting block that's more unified that also had some generational wealth now that it didn't have before they started buying up that land. They thought they were going to basically give them as low as possible and it would move those people out and they'd be rid of them. But the reality is that no, it actually reinvigorated and recreated some of our black community in a way that had lost a lot of access to any money, but also killed some of, um, I want to say like a, a really important part of our historical section of town that sadly is gone now like we don't have the old post office like we did that dated back to reconstruction uh, a lot of the houses that were pre-1900s were destroyed um and we didn't have much because after the civil war um well actually during the civil war we had all but two of our houses in town burnt down so it was one of those very few spots that had some post reconstruction houses so from around the uh late 1870s that were torn down to make way for a highway but very much a, a surgical scar that cuts through and i think that kell is also a really great example here in town of uh, something that does scar us with that divide i'm gonna have to stop us there because i know for a fact that 
me and Jeff can talk for five hours right. nonstop without thinking about it. And I know that uh, we're going over an hour at this point, right. and um, Scrap Joe still thing. wants to talk about but... what, what's going on here in town. Thank uh, you Jeff, for that, Ryan. You're because... more than welcome to come back, and we can continue this conversation at some point. But I think we need to wrap it up now. That was the exact point where I was where I was thinking, oh gosh, I really want to keep talking about this, and this would be a really awkward place I... to stop the podcast because this is this is a really important conversation especially with our town with with american history and the southern history and just so, everything that's happening right now with uh like segregated neighborhoods and stuff like that's still a thing i could talk about that for also for hours with the the part of east texas that i come from like they're still it's not official obviously it's not official but the way that towns are still kind of segregated like it's still a big thing so where are you from in east texas uh i'm from the texarkana area Okay. There are little bitty towns there that are still like, it's it's not obvious, but if if you talk to the people in the town, you see how the town's structured and stuff. It's you know they they're what's that? I've been through the area, so you probably know we, what we I'm can talking talk about. about. The folk Bigfoot too. Oh yeah, the Falk monster. Yeah. All right, now we're gonna extend this to a two-hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really wish we could, but yeah, we, we try to. We try to respect everyone's time here, and we've we've taken up quite a bit of yours. Uh, anytime you want to come back on and, and talk more about this, we'd be absolutely happy happy to have you on. It would probably make more sense. <laughs> What's that? I'd probably make more sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, although we, 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 we battle gotta... about weird things all the time, so don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we um, yeah, we're we're gonna probably start wrapping things up uh dr clegg was there anything that you wanted to mention any kind of classes that you're teaching here in the here in the near future no just business uh, writing okay <laughs> all right um yeah so hopefully we can at the library hopefully we can start talking to your uh your business classes too that'd be really nice yeah but, yeah. yeah but uh joe did you want to talk about anything going on in the community around campus anything like we usually do Sure. Uh, and, and most of the things that I have on my page uh, for this month actually are in or on or around campus rather than more throughout the community. Um, I'll go ahead and do my usual pitch, which is that if anyone out there has an event that you would like for us to mention, or if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for us, uh, please email library at msutexas.edu. If you want to have more information about the things that we mention uh, on the podcast or local activities, check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage uh, and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. Uh, now, as far as things that are going on right uh, now or will be soon, uh, this weekend, MSU Texas Theater is presenting two plays by Anton Chekhov, A Marriage Proposal and The Bear. Uh, the MSU Burns Fantasy of Lights opening ceremony will be Monday, November 20th, uh, followed by the Festival of Lights concert in Aiken Auditorium. Uh, on November 30th in Legacy Hall, the faculty forum uh, will be uh, Greg Giddings' presentation of uh, John Williams, Wichita Falls' greatest uh, writer. Uh, here at the library, we're bringing the therapy dogs back for finals. Uh, the dogs will be here in our atrium from 6 to 7.30 on Monday, December 4th, and on Wednesday, December 6th. Uh, and on December 10th, uh, MSU Texas Music brings you uh, Handel's Messiah with the MSU Texas Choirs and the First United Methodist Church Choir. Um, and that's really it. Well, alrighty. Uh, I think that'll just about do it for us. Uh, anything else anyone wants to add before we sign off? Yes, but we shouldn't be here for another three hours. That's yes. That's that's Fair. also yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you now you though I do want to watch the I can't remember who who the director is, but the that Falk monster documentary. Um, he also did the Phantom of the Opera film. I, I kind of have an itch to watch those. Not Phantom of the Opera, the, the Texas Phantom. Uh, the Town that Dreaded Sundown. Yeah. Uh, the, the Texarkana Phantom. Legend now I've got an itch to watch both of those. So, 
Uh, yeah, this has been absolutely fascinating. Dr. Clegg, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, that'll you. just about do it for us here in Moffitt Library. Oh, um, as a PS, I did want to mention we are opening our new podcast studio. I did say that we were going to talk about it just, just briefly. Um, our first installment in that one, actually, we're going to be doing an interview with President Stacey Haynes. Uh, that will be later in January. Um, Hopefully, I'll be back after my paternity leave from, uh, so I could also uh, be a part of that. We're very, very excited to get this done. More information will be coming to you uh, here in the near future. But uh, that's going to be something that we're going to try to also have uh, available for students. So um, we'll have to talk to you a little bit more about that as we get more information. Uh, it's still... Some of that is still in the planning stages. The room itself is done. It's finished. You can come by and see what it looks like here. It's going to be in our lobby. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that one. We'll, we're more than happy to share information about that as it comes out. So uh, from all of us here at Moffat Library, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.